the cloud. All right, so yeah, so I will, the midterm is due Thursday, but end of day, if you need a little more time, just reach out to me. I have already had somebody who had a conflict, so I won't be able to get them back to you until I'm aiming for next Tuesday. I can't promise that next Tuesday, so I guarantee you'll get them back next Thursday. I haven't gotten too many questions so far, um, which means I guess I did a semi-competent job of designing the thing. So um, hopefully that continues to be the case. If at any point you have any questions, comments, concerns, just feel free to reach out. I'm happy to answer. It can be anything. If you want a like Zoom meeting as well about it, also fine. Um, so yeah, and also the exam is due after this class. Also, end of day Thursday is like, that's the official thing, but if you got it to me Friday, like morning, if you're like, hey, I wanted to sleep tonight, um, just let me know. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna care if you turn it in at like, if you turn it at 1201, I definitely don't care. And if you turn it in eight the next morning, just let me know that you're going to be turning it in at eight the next morning, honestly. Other people care about deadlines. That's not my lot in life to care about those things. What is, is it poetry? Sorry, computer people, you can't see the, uh, there's a there's piece of paper with poetry written on them in the classroom. Who just walked in? Anna? Yeah. Awesome. Just wanted to make sure. And then Makai, you came on. Okay. Well, it's hard to, I can't really be anything. Sandra says, thank you for flexibility. I can't really not be flexible when we're like, we're like half in Zoom world. Like it's a real kind of conundrum of like, are we an online class or an in-person class? Do I exist? Do you exist? Does this class exist? Like it's really changing everything around. All right, so today's topic is going to basically be um, heuristics. And basically the way to, I don't know if I'm spelling this right, heuristics. Um, the way to think of this class is uh, everything we've done up to this point has been um, talking about how to think and reason well. And part of the reason it's been so boring and teeth pulley at times is that we're not very good at it. Uh, and the fact is that a lot of us, and I include myself in this, we are designed in a way which allows us, was really, really good when our main goal was to survive on the African savanna like 100,000 years ago. And not as good today when we have to deal with things like climate change and population control and viruses and politics. And so basically all the things we've learned up to this point was the, how do you do it well? And that was gonna be the, if that's how you do it well and we taught it, why is it that we still all suck with it? And what heuristics are basic, have people heard this term before? Online people or people people? Basically the way you can think of what a heuristic is, is it's a shortcut of thinking. And what you can think of it as is basically, it's like a rule of thumb that we use when thinking that gets us the right answer enough of the time, rule of thumb, rule of thumb in thinking that is quick and usually right, but not always. Right. And so a heuristic is a way of thinking. It's kind of like a quick and dirty way of getting something done. So you're going to get the right answer most of the time. The problem is you don't always get the right answer. And because you don't always get the right answer, and because you don't get all, always get the right answer in the right in a certain way. And the thing about heuristics is they're wrong in a very patterned sort of way. Anyone who knows heuristics can use this against you to manipulate you. It also means that you will make similar sorts of mistakes over and over again in your thought. And so if we want to think well, one of the best ways to do it is identify the ways in which we think poorly and the sorts of mistakes we make. And so what I want to do is, um, because we're online in half and in person in half, I can't do what I did last time, which is uh, last class, I kicked half the people out and made them answer some questions. We're just going to answer these questions as a group. We're going to go with our gut feelings. And basically, these are going to be five completely random questions. Well, the first time I took this quiz, um, it's not a quiz. You're not losing points. You're not graded. It's literally going to be five random questions where I'm just going to ask you, what are you, why do you think this is? Or what do you think the answer is? 
you will give me the answer and then we'll talk about why the answers you give, which are the exact same answers I gave the first time are all wrong. And that's what we're gonna do. It's just basically, this will be a class on why are we all making mistakes? And it's not to laugh at ourselves or laugh at each other. It's literally just to be like, oh, my brain works in this way. It makes mistakes. Therefore, maybe I can correct these in the future. So the way to, oh, I don't have an eraser. Yes, I'm using a white t-shirt. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> I'm gonna write this question down and then I will um, read it out to everyone and then we can talk about it. But basically the first question I wanna talk about is just about every year, the county in the US with the most, or no, sorry, the highest rate of colon cancer is a sparsely populated rural Republican leaning, Republican leaning county in either South, Midwest, or West. Why do you? <laughs> yes, yes. That's our first question. I'm reading it out. Um, just about every year, the county in the U.S. with the highest rate of colon cancer. So this is the most. So I'm gonna put most cases per <laughs> 100 people is a sparsely populated rural Republican leaning county in either the South, Midwest or West. Why do you think this is the case? <coughs> I'm having an allergic reaction to this mask. It's been in my dusty bag. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, why do you think this is the case? Either online people or in-person people. Anyone have any hypotheses as to why it would be the case that every year the county where the most people per 100 get colon cancer is a sparsely populated rural Republican leaning county in the South, Midwest, or West. Any hypotheses people have? Wait, are you giving this as a fact? Yes, this is a fact. Oh. This is actually true. Almost every year, this is the case. Does anyone have any ideas why? Um, Your genetics. So one thought is genetics, that maybe in this area, there's something about just people who live here that they happen to have a genetics. Anything, any other guesses? It could be their diet. Diet could be one. Oh yeah, I keep forgetting I have to click this. So we have diet, Sandra, was that you? Okay, so yeah, diet, genetics. Um, that was me, sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Environment. So it might just be that there's something about these Republican leaning rural counties. Any other guesses? Maybe education? Education might be one. All right, I need to change the mask that isn't gonna make me talk to that. I can also ask you all who are here, but I don't wanna force us to take a vote <coughs> mid class. <laughs> all right, genetics, education is a guess. Um, my first thought the first time I saw this was something about uh, Republican spending on healthcare was one guess, Republican healthcare. Public can cuts to health care. Um, any other guesses? I'm going to tell us every one of us is wrong, first off. None of these are the right answer. Um, and to give us a clue of why these aren't the right answer, I'm going to change this around and give you another fact. And this fact is just about every year, the county in the U.S. with the lowest rate of colon cancer, i.e. the fewest cases per 100, 
people is a sparsely populated rural Republican leaning county in either South, Midwest, or West. Why do you think that is? It's because South, Midwest, or West is like too big of a population for us to be like, oh, it could be the highest of the lowest. So you're on the right track with it having to do with the populated bit and the fact that there are these populations. But what is it? So we can work our way through these key words and we can talk about which is the one that really matters. So I'm gonna say right now, the fact, the actual explanation for why this is the case has nothing to do with it being Republican, completely unrelated. Uh, anyone guess which other words can be eliminated? We've got option one, sparsely populated, two, rural, three, the location. Which one should go next? Well, we're going to get there. Let's eliminate the bad before we go good. Okay. Any guesses? I mean, the location, matter? location doesn't end up mattering. It's got the, it, you think it does, but really it doesn't have to, that much to do with it. Again, rural doesn't matter. What matters? All that matters, the only explanation is sparsely populated. Why? This right here, this question, and the answer to this question, the explanation for it is our friends from the fallacies week. This explanation for this is small sample combined with questionable cause. So you see these numbers and you assume as a human being that this big description I gave you is in some way relevant to the explanation of why this place has a lot of colon cancer. Or you see this description and you think, oh, something about all these facts is somehow relevant to the fact that not many people get colon cancer. So if I give that one first, the answer is very often things like, um, oh, they have better air quality there, or it's more spread out, or they have a better, healthier diet with their outdoor <laughs> lifestyle. When really the explanation in both cases is that it's sparsely populated. Now, why does that matter? Well, let's talk about the fewest cases per 100 people, most cases. Now, I looked up the statistics before class and the percentage of Americans every year that get colon cancer is 0.03%. So that's like, what is that? Three out of every 10,000, I think. Um, three out of every 10,000 people. So if you are above this number, you are going to be in the potential for being high. And if you are below this number, you're going to be in the potential for being very low on this count. Now, does anyone, does, we used Kings County last class and because that's on my mind and I actually happen to know the population of it, unless anybody knows the population of Manhattan County and wants to go with it. Anybody else? Okay, so Kings is, so Kings versus Brooklyn is 2.25 million. Now, if you've got 2.25 million, on average, the number of people that would get colon cancer in a year is this. So whatever that number is. What are the odds if there's 2.25 million people that nobody gets colon cancer in a year? Nobody within, because that would be 0%. 0% in Kings County would be zero out of 2.25 million. What are the odds? Just like intuitively, commonsensically, does that in any way seem likely that in an entire year, nobody in Brooklyn would get colon cancer? No, it seems really unlikely. Now, let us talk about our, so this was Kings. Now let's talk about our dear friend, I think it's Lovings, or no, I think it's Loving County, Texas. Anyone want to guess what the population of Loving County, Texas was? They don't have the new 2020 set, census number. Anyone want to guess how many people live there in 2010? Down. Less than death. How, keep going. We're going below. Less. 70. It was 82. So let's assume that they went up to 100% or they like, like they made some babies and now they're at 100 people. So in Loving County, Texas, what are the odds that nobody has colon cancer? There's only 100 people. It's a pretty good chance that nobody has colon cancer. So there's a pretty good chance that Loving County, Texas is at 0%. Therefore, it's pretty likely that Loving County, Texas is the lowest in the nation because 0% of the people there have colon cancer. That's well below the national average. It's possible that Brooklyn is below the national average, but it's almost impossible that Brooklyn's all the way at zero. Does that make sense to everyone? The idea is basically that 
if you've got a huge number of people and something is unlikely to happen, still, if the number of people is large enough, the odds that it happens to somebody in that group is decent. If you've got a tiny group of people, the odds of it not happening to anyone, pretty good. And since the highest rate is just the total number of people who get the disease divided by the total number of people overall, zero divided by 100 is gonna be zero. If you even have one person who gets it in Brooklyn, one divided by 2.25 million is a lot of people, or I mean, not many people, it's still like a tiny percentage, but it's still higher than zero. So that's why Loving County, Texas has such a low number of people with colon cancer, is if you take the entire population, randomly selected people out of the entire United States, you're gonna have 0.03%. But the odds in any given county that has a tiny population, pretty good chance that it's zero. So therefore, we're gonna have a county that the lowest in the nation is gonna be zero. Now on the flip side, if one person in Kings County gets colon cancer in a year, how many people, what percentage has colon cancer? Very, very little. I'd ask you to do math, but I don't care. And you don't care either. So it's very, very small percent. If one person in Loving County, Texas gets it, how many people have colon cancer in that state? One percent, which is like 33 times higher than the national average. And it's just because, now odds are nobody has it, but if you add together Loving County, Texas, and all the other counties that have like a thousand people or less, one of them probably has one person with colon cancer. And that county is going to be the highest in the nation just because that one person has it. So does this make sense to everyone? How statistics can be used to lie to you and make things sound way worse than they are or way better than they are. So this sort of case is just like a pure math case, but you can think of how politicians might use this. So one thing that politicians will often do is say something about the crime rate or the murder rate. And if you have a county like Brooklyn, even if the murder rate goes down, it's not gonna go down that far from the average number. But if you're talking about like rural Texas where everybody has a firearm because it's rural Texas, somebody's gonna point to this and say, look, firearms keep people safe because look at these rural Texas counties and lowest murder rate in the country over and over again. Like they have all the guns, but everyone's safe. Nobody's getting murdered. Or on the flip side, someone might say, look at Loving County, Texas. One person, 1% 1 of the population gets murdered a year. We can't have guns. You can't allow anybody to live this way. And it, both ways though, it's just twisting the statistic to make it seem when in truth, it's just a small sample size issue and explaining trying to find a cause or an explanation for something that's just completely random. And so this is one of the first ways in which our minds can be led astray by our own way of thinking. We can be tricked into thinking there's a cause for something when it's really just, when you're dealing with small numbers, crazy events happen. It's the same sort of thing where if I flip the coin a hundred times, what are the odds that I get all heads? I don't need the actual number. Would you bet on it? that I, if I flip the coin a hundred times that I get all heads every time. No, what if I flip the coin once? What a 50-50 chance, you know, it's worth a shot. Um, depends on what odds you got and everything. Um, but yeah, again, so extreme things are far more likely to happen in small numbers. This is just the small sample size issue all over again in a way that is much trickier to pick up on. Because in our everyday life, when you're reading about, we asked 30 Americans and all of them said this, it's pretty easy to recognize something's going wrong. But in this sort of case, it's kind of hidden in the background. So whenever you see something like highest rate, lowest rate, always ask yourself like, what was there? How many people were being asked? Is it just the population explaining it? Sometimes like COVID is an interesting case because part of the reason that probably the highest COVID rates in the nation right now are small, counties is for this reason, but then there's also a case in which part of it is probably the places that are small. Half that case, Republican leaning seems to actually make a difference, but you have to keep in mind of how these things work together whenever you're trying to understand why is this the case. Just because something's a high percentage, you can't just assume it's a high percentage because of one thing causing another. So does that make sense to everyone? All right, here's your next one. I give you five bucks. Oh, here I have this. Um, it's small number of people, yeah. Sparsely populated, so sparse as in like, I don't know how, sparse is just like 
they're far spread out from each other. Yeah. Um, so yeah, small numbers of people over a very large distance. So like the other thing about Loving County, Texas is it's probably by distance, like 12 times the size of Brooklyn, but there's a hundred people in. I mean, I once, I, we went on a family vacation like when I was young to Wyoming and we passed the wonderful town of Shell, Wyoming and had like the big green, you're welcome to Shell, population eight. I was just like, this is, yeah, there are places in America where there's no, there was somebody else with a 32 mile long driveway. Like imagine getting the mail. That's like from here to all the, no, that's not quite Albany, but that's like what? It's like, that's farther than like, it's like, is that quite Poughkeepsie? It's a ways up there, 30 miles. All right, um, I, I'm gonna give each of you five bucks and I'm gonna tell you to go play the Powerball. And here are the, I tell you, you have to choose one of these three numbers selections to play the Powerball. Here are your options. Which one would you choose? Okay. How many of you, your initial gut feeling is B? That's my certainly my initial gut feeling. Those of you on the computer, can you see what the number sets are? Yeah. Yeah, okay. What are people's answer? Which one would you go with? Computer people or live people? Is there anyone who would definitely go with A? Okay. Anyone go with C? One, two, three, four, five, six. What's the correct answer? Does it matter? No. no, in truth, it doesn't matter. And yet so many of us gravitate towards B. Why is it that so many of us feel that B is the most likely of the three? Uh, I don't think we're looking at it like it's the most likely. I just think it's just our because we've never seen something like that. Yeah, they look, these look like they have a reason behind them. Like how could it possibly be random? And we know the lottery is random. The only one of these that looks random is this one. This looks like it was chosen randomly. These all look like they were chosen for a purpose. Therefore we conclude, well, we know that lottery is never purposeful, but in truth, which of these is most likely? They're all equally likely. Every single one of these is the exact same likelihood. You can do it more clearly if we just write up these numbers. One, 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 one versus two, seven, one, four, six. These numbers, if you're randomly picking a five digit number are equally likely. Why? What's the odds? Let's just focus one digit at a time. Imagine I give you like 10 ping pong balls and on these ping pong balls are written the numbers zero through nine. If I pull out one ball, what are the odds that I pull out a one? How many balls are there total? 10. And I just pulled out one of those 10 and it was a one. So this, the odds of it would be 10%. If I chose, what are the odds of it being a two? 10%. What are the odds of it being a one? To, if I put it back in there, again, every single time is just 10%. Any given number, the odds are just 10%. But we think this one is less likely because it looks somehow not random. But the key thing to remember about randomness is that just because something looks not random does not mean it isn't random. And this goes back to our questionable cause case. Why is it that we, yeah, Also, you have to think about, you talk about each like, um, number individually, but also what are the chances of all of them together? It's another chance because 66, Point 0.1 times point 0.1. So let's go here. It will be point 0.1 times point 0.1 times, it's actually slightly different because it's more than 10 numbers, times point 0.1 times point 0.1 times point 0.1 times point 0.1. That's the likelihood of getting this number because the odds of you getting, let's just imagine, it's easier with this when in truth, I think, how many numbers are there? It's like 75 or something like that. So it'll be one out of 75 times one out of 75. Times one out of 75 
times one out of 75 times one out of 75. Because 66 is just one of the 75 possible numbers. The odds of 55 following it is no different than any other number following it. This is a completely unrelated to what's come before. It's just totally at random. So even if it looks like, oh, 55 after 66, that's so weird. There must be an explanation. The explanation is you're just picking balls out of a hat and occasionally something weird happens. So again, which is gonna be the same as this. This is just one out of 75 times one out of 75 times one out. Every single set of random numbers is equally likely no matter how normal it looks, which is why the best way to think of the lottery is a tax that you do voluntarily. Because the fact is the lottery is designed to make you lose money. Like the goal is not to get you to win. They don't like someone to win. And the way they, the reason why the lottery is still able to exist is because the number of people who lose money is so high and the number of people who win is so low that over the, over the span of a year, the government makes a ton of money. So if your goal is to pay more taxes than you otherwise would, play the lottery. It's a great way to dedicate yourself to civic growth and the well-being of the country. If you actually want to make money, don't play the lottery. You're just giving money away. Because every, and here's a way to think about it. You never bet on this because you look at it and say the odds of that happening, completely super low. This one though looks random. We have this category of just like random numbers. So really 66, 55, 44, 33, 22, 11. This one would lose just as badly as this would lose if the eight was the real answer. They both lose. They're both completely unlikely. It's just this one somehow looks likelier because it looks on random. And this goes back to our questionable cause. If something looks patterned, we assume that there has to be an explanation or cause for it having a pattern. When in truth, random things can just happen. And you always have to ask yourself, is the fact that something's happening or there's this pattern actually the, the result of something that actually has an explanation? Or is it just that if you do enough random things enough times, eventually something weird is going to happen? And that's the explanation for why we all want to say B, when in truth, they're all exactly the same. Which again, getting the same number every time in the lottery, if you ever feel that urge to pay the lottery, but you don't want to just pay the government money, remind yourself, the odds of me winning the lottery are the same of getting one, two, three, four, five, six, which like, I would never bet on that. So just remind yourself of that fact. Any questions on this stuff so far? All right. Um, anyone have any guesses as to why it would be the case that we have this tendency? You know, I, I'm, all right, people who are here, I'm going to exit the room for, um, with my fingers in my ears for 15 seconds. I'm dying with this mask on. I do not, however, want to subject you all to me maskless if you're not comfortable. I can go and try to put back on the other one. I'm just starting to hyperventilate. So I just want to make sure everyone's comfortable. Are we all good? Yeah. We good, Arsh? Yeah. Yeah. All right. I just don't want to subject you all. Just like, just want to make sure. Um, thank you all. Um, <laughs> I was literally going to pass out by end of class. <laughs> Oh, my lungs are killing me. Oh, I feel like one of those like marathon athletes who like trains in the mountains or wears one of those little masks to run. Um, anyway, so anyone have any ideas as to why we would have this tendency if we see a pattern to assume there must be some explanation for it? Anyone have any ideas? It goes back to evolution and survival. So yeah, and why is it then that if we see something that's a pattern like this, we assume there's some sort of thought or explanation instead of just assuming it's random? It's like in nature, there's always like explanation. Yeah, so here's the thing. In nature, odds are that if there's a pattern to something or something happens and then something else happened, there's a pretty good chance that the one thing caused the other. And more importantly, even if it didn't cause the other thing, there's generally little harm in assuming there is. So if you first see like a random, um, so you see a bird fly by and then you feel sick and you come to the conclusion, the bird made me feel sick. So therefore going forward, you avoid that part of the forest where there's a bird. Is there any harm really done by doing this? No, you're like, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure. Uh, so I'm just gonna stay away. There's no harm done. 
as long as that's you don't like need that part of the forest to survive. But over guessing isn't going to cause you any problems. But now imagine that one day you see a tiger and an hour later your child disappears. Now you didn't see the tiger take your child, but what's the natural conclusion to draw? The tiger took, yeah, and now you're going to either kill the tiger or stay away from the tiger. Now, what if somebody comes along and says, well, we don't know. We didn't actually see the tiger kill the child. Should we, we really shouldn't jump to any conclusions here. Like, what are you going to say to this person? It's going to be like, no, you idiot. You're going to get eaten. Like, it's better to be safe than sorry. So out in the wilderness, if there's a pattern, there's a reason to guess that like one thing caused another, because if you're wrong, not a big deal. If you guess it is the case when it isn't. If, however, you guess it isn't the case when it is actually, so if you guess something's not, something is a danger when it's not, no harm done. If you guess something isn't a danger when it is, you get eaten. So because of this, we are trained, we're somehow wired to look for any sort of thing that could be a pattern and assume that it is because we're biased to assume causes that goes back to this assumption of if one thing happened and then another thing happened and it was related to danger, we need to be as careful as possible because, you know, you only get one chance to live. If you screw up in that and you die, it's over. If you screw up and get overly careful um, and assume something's danger when it's not, then what ends up happening is nothing bad in the wilderness. However, these same sorts of pattern lookings these days lead to a lot of problems. The same thing of assume something happened and then something else happened, therefore come to the conclusion that it's danger. Where does this come up in our modern society in a way that is much less beneficial? Any guesses? Well, what is the reason that so many people are racist? What is the thinking behind it? And what is the justification they give? Well, they will go around and look at people of a certain race and see like, oh, people of this race, there's a high crime rate in this area. Therefore, I see person of this race, high crime rate, this race is violent. Nowadays, that's the same sort of pattern. In the ancient times, you think, well, this, there was violence there and this person looked this way. There was no harm back in caveman ages to assuming that the way that person looked was in some way harmful because you weren't interacting outside of your group very often. Nowadays, though, the tendency to see obvious patterns in a world that's complicated leads us to jump to conclusions and leads to these sorts of discrimination and biases against people of certain groups simply because we, we jump to a simple pattern. So does that make sense to everyone about how the very same thing that makes us more likely to think that this is uh, random or this is random than this is, is the same thing that leads people to think the reason why people of a certain area are, you know, X or Y is because of their race, as opposed to the incredibly complicated, somewhat random historical things having to do with where gunpowder was found and the history of slavery and all these other very complicated things. That like, it's much easier to think race, like racist thinking is much simpler than actually understanding how the world's like history brought us to this point. So therefore people will jump to these conclusions in this because they assume, well, simple pattern, one must cause the other. Any questions, comments, concerns at this point? All right, let's jump into. Uh, yes. That questionable cause. So this is questionable cause. Yeah. No. So this is questionable cause. So this is really um, the book or the, the the reading for today talked about in terms of the like the law of small numbers, but it's really just this tendency to see patterns in things. And that's our heuristic. So the heuristic is just this tendency of human beings to see patterns in the world, even in random things. And a lot of the time, like it is unlikely that this came about in a principled way. Like this is probably random. And it's also probably the case that this particular pattern happened for a reason. Most of the time you see the number one, two, three, four, five, six, it's because someone's counting. But not every case of one, two, three, four, five, six is counting. Sometimes it's random. And the tendency is to assume it's always reason, there's reason for it, when sometimes it is just completely random. And so the heuristic is just like seeing patterns in the world. All right, um, let's do the, the other fun one now. I'm gonna put up six types of animals. And I want you to tell me in order from the least to the most or from the most to the least. 
Which of these types of animals kills the most people in the United States each year? So animal one is a rabbit. Animal two is a shark. Animal three is, I'm putting alligators and crocodiles together into one category. Four is snake. Five is bear. And six is cow. Which of these kills the least people and which of these kills the most? And does anyone have any guesses about what order they should go in? So those of you online, it's rabbit, shark, alligator slash crocodile, which I think I spelled wrong, snake, bear, and cow. It's cow. So we have a guess of alligator for most. Hannah, what was your guess? I guess rabbit is the least. Yeah, rabbit is the least. Like, I'm just going to give you that one. Like, that one's pretty straight for like. I think cow is the most. Say that again, Sandra. I think cow is the most. Is, is she right? Yes, she is. Cow is number one. Cow is the most deadly animal in the United States of these up on the list. So what, so the actual order is cow is one, rabbit is six, uh, two I think is snake, three is bear, four, five, six. So, um, and the actual numbers, rabbits are zero. Rabbits don't kill people. Like the only killer rabbit was in Monty Python and that was a comedy movie. So rabbits don't kill people. Um, the number of shark deaths, I think was 0.57 people per year. I think it's like one and a half people die every two years or something like that. It's basically like every three years, two people die. Um, alligators and crocodiles is six, six, six repeating. Um, snakes is 10 to 15 people a year. Bears is one to two and cows is 15 to 20. So, um, and these aren't like cow diseases. These are literally like a cow tramples you or stabs you with its cow horns. Uh, so these are really like attack of the killer cows. So those of us, and I mean, my first guess is never cow. And honestly, outside of a classroom setting in which I might be trying to prove a point, I don't think anyone's gonna guess cow. Um, and yet cow is the right answer. Why is it that we are so unlikely to guess that cows are the most deadly? And yet people generally think like alligators, snakes, sharks, what's the difference? Here I go. Um, I think I'm just writing it on how dangerous they might see or look instead of calculating on how, how regular, how, um, how often you see that animal. That's, that's a big thing. It's about how deadly do they seem? And what's our number one thing in which, what do we think back to when we're trying to think about how deadly an animal seems? We think about the size of it. And what else do we think of? How many of you have seen the movie Jaws or heard of the movie Jaws? How many of you are familiar with Shark Week? How many of you are familiar with Cow Week? How many of you are familiar with Attack of the Killer Cows? Like this movie doesn't exist. We don't think quickly of murderous cows. About the only thing we have is like the running of the bulls. And then it's just generally like, why do people in Spain release a bunch of bulls down a road and run away from them? Like that's our main thought if we think about killer. You don't think of like the cow that you got your milk from as like, getting mad that it has to be part of a, like a industrial farm and like attacking someone. We think about bear attacks. We think about snakes. Like we know they got big pointy teeth. They're kind of creepy. Alligators, again, they have big chompy teeth. Rabbits, we think of them as cute and fluffy and we're right. They are, they don't attack anyone. Occasionally they'll bite you in by accident. Um, I saw a pig on a fire truck today. That was exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's like the fire department has like I ended up looking this up and it's supposedly somebody associated with the fire department decided to like bring their pet pig in as the like mascot. Yeah. Is that a hint? The fact is that rabbits really can't die. Yeah. Like, so very soft. Yeah. They're super soft. They're not dead. Like they have kind of sharp teeth, but it's not like it could bite you to death. These other things though, it's very easy to think of news stories or movies. Cow is much harder, so we don't think cow. This is what is called the availability heuristic. And basically what the availability heuristic is, is the easier it is to think of something, the more likely you think it is to happen. So that you can think of shark attacks or things about shark attacks. You can't really think of cow attacks. I bet if you were actually to ask a group of farmers, they'd be much more likely to guess cow because they've probably had to deal with a pissed off cow before. I've never encountered a pissed off cow. The only cows I've ever encountered are at like a petting zoo or like out in a field where they're just like mowing on the grass and it's not like they're attacking anything. 
And the reason, I mean, the reason why cows are the most deadly is that exactly what Kirioka said. There's so many cows, like they're everywhere. Like you go out, like leave the city and they're just suddenly everywhere. I never see a bear. Snakes, it's like maybe the zoo. Alligators, maybe the zoo. Sharks, I've never seen a shark except at the aquarium and they can't get you through like eight inch glass. But like a cow, they have pretty good access to people and they're big. They're not small things. They got big pointy horns. So yeah. But the reason we don't guess cow is because we think of these moments where these bloody shark attacks we've seen shark week, et cetera. We see what their teeth look like. We think they're oh so big. We don't think of that with the cow. So the availability heuristic, and why then do we have this? Why is this a way of thinking? Well, because most of the time, the availability heuristic gets us the right answer. So for instance, how many of you can easily call to mind a rabbit attack? None of you should probably be able to. And the reason why is because it never happens. So that case is right. Another thing is what happens more often, snow or rain? Rain. rain. You all answer that immediately. And the reason why is largely that you can think of times it rained much more recently than times it snowed. So again, availability heuristic is good. Again, if you are thinking about like, which of my friends is trustworthy, you think to yourself, well, who's, who lied to me more recently? Oh, that one did, they're less trustworthy. So we use this way of thinking, Hannah. Is that the same way of thinking of bias? Yes, so an availability heuristic is the similar, it's a type of bias. So it, we are, so bias is really the general category and all these heuristics lead us to be biased in different ways. So this is one particular way to be biased. And you are biased towards things that are, your guessing of likelihood is biased by what's easy to call to mind. And the reason why we have this is because in most cases, the easier something is to call to mind, the more likely it is to happen a lot. You can remember times you, uh, ate lunch with a friend more than you can remember times you ate lunch with your grandma, probably because you had lunch with your friends more often. However, there are some cases in which it leads us astray. And what it can do is the, another reason why things are easy to call to mind is simply that they were incredibly emotionally charged. And just the nature of the human mind is charged emotions are easy to remember. So um, if you got terrible news at some point in your life about a family member, about someone, you probably remember in re relative detail what room you were in, what it looked like, anything like that. And that's because the emotion behind it allows your, like basically the nature of the human mind is the higher energy or higher emotion you are, the easier you remember it. So if something is incredibly highly charged, you will remember it much more easily and then be more likely to think it's common. So one way in which this sort of thing happens is very few of us get into a car every time and think, I'm taking my life into my own hands right now. And yet the fact of the matter is getting into a car is way more dangerous than most of the things which we're scared of. Like you are so much more likely to die in a car crash than be mugged. And yet most of us are far more worried about muggings. Why? Because muggings are traumatic experiences. You, if you're somebody who's experienced it, you will never forget that moment. If you're somebody who knows someone who's been mugged, you think of that. It's a very traumatic, emotionally charged experience that leads you to think this must be more likely than a car accident because car accidents happen so often that we don't really think about them that often. Um, another thing that this is tied into is uh, terrorist attacks. People greatly overestimate the likelihood of terrorist attacks because those that have happened are incredibly traumatic and have had, especially in New York, direct impacts on people we know or family members, or people family members know. So because of that, people are far more likely to think they're going to get killed in a terrorist attack than they are getting struck by lightning, when really you're way more likely to get struck by lightning. Um, like the the likelihood of dying in a terrorist attack is like slightly above the bunny rabbit attacks. It's just, they're that rare, but because they were such a charged thing, people are very, and even in places with like large numbers of terrorist attacks, it's still much less like places in the Middle East where there's like large numbers of terrorist attacks relative to the world. It's still much lower than dying of like a heart attack or anything like that. So, it, but the heart attacks, like they just seem, even if you've had a family member who died of a heart attack, it doesn't have quite the same level of emotional charge as a terrorist attack or something like that. 
So this is the availability heuristic. Just the more traumatic something is, the more likely it is for us to think it happens. Um, could it be because people are more scared of home security? That's another aspect is there's a thing in which the randomness makes it more like if it's something that just happens to you and you feel powerless that can raise the emotion levels. So with a terrorist attack as well, part of the reason that it's so emotionally charged is that it feels like it's completely out of the blue and it's random. Well, with health stuff, you could like say, oh, it was my diet, oh, it was my this. So that raises the stress levels too, which again makes you more likely to think it's going to happen. And this is another one of those things where most of the time there's no problem with like falling prey to the availability heuristic because most of the time it's not going to cause you any problem to overestimate like you might just like your friends might make fun of you for being a nervous nelly or something like that but most of the time if you like if you think you're going to be mugged all the time then the one time you might actually be mugged you're going to be extra careful and there's really no harm done and if you just spend most of your life looking over your shoulder, like, yeah, you might like pull a neck muscle, but it's not going to like kill you or anything like that. It's not a big deal. But again, there can be issues with the availability heuristic and it can lead to problems. So does anyone just, while well, I take a sip of water, have any ideas of things where the availability heuristic might go wrong or lead to problems in the modern world? Where the fact that something is easy to call to mind makes us think it is very likely, and the fact that something is hard to call to mind makes us underestimate how likely it is. That's exactly the one I was thinking of. One of the reasons that it is so hard to get people worried about climate change is that nobody has experienced it before and nobody can call to mind what it will actually be like. Like before Hurricane Sandy happened, no one in New York was capable of thinking of complete flooding of the entire city, destroying hundreds of millions to billions of dollars of property and ruining many ordinary people's lives. Completely off our radar. No one could think of it. So every everyone thought couldn't happen. In the same way, we know that like, even if somebody says like flooding is coming with global warming, flooding is going to happen. If we haven't experienced it, we don't in the same way have this feeling of it's going to actually happen and it's going to directly affect my life. What? What does it say, like, the pandemic really That's another really good one. Why was it that our U.S. government had been cutting the budget of like the Center for Disease and like the groups around pandemics. Well, because we'd never seen a pandemic. We had seen terrorist attacks. So large amounts of the budget was going into terrorist attacks because we could call them to mind. But the thought of a pandemic was literally until two years ago, the stuff of a, like a, a sci-fi zombie, like outside of zombie movies, like I had never seen a pandemic. And the fact that I can think of a zombie apocalypse doesn't seem like a reason to change around the US tax money. But like, oh, I could think of a terrorist attack. So we got to like, go into a war. But I can't imagine what a pandemic's like, not gonna be worried about it. And then when it came, we were completely blindsided in large part because we couldn't prepare for it. So this is where it can go awry is even if we have mathematical models that tell us like, this is going to happen, this is happening. People aren't gonna get worried about it unless they can think of it. Like until you saw the subways flooding, I never conceived of the possibility of the subway system flooding. Like, it was just like, yeah, someday New York's going to be underwater. Yeah, that'll happen sometime. My grandkids can worry about it. Yeah, don't worry. Now it's like, oh, crap. I now know what it looks like. And now I'm suddenly a lot scared. Like, now it's like, you know, an actual thing that we are, people are. And this is part of the reason why, uh, climate change is beginning to get some traction among some people is now that we are actually able to see the effects to some degree. Um, but even then, there's still the fact that, you know, it, it's hard to convince people who don't want to see two things as linked together, that they are linked together. Another really strange side effect of the availability heuristic is this strange thing of um, the less somebody defends their case, the more strongly they believe it. So when I ask you, so um, do any of you have a pet um, that does like funny things? Like, okay, does anyone have a funny cat or funny dog that does some silly stuff? So if I asked you, like, tell me one, like I asked you, is your dog funny? And you're like, yes, my dog is funny. And I asked you, tell me one funny thing your dog did. Well, oh, the cat, but- um, Or your cat did. Well, I don't know if this is, 
like rabbit or something. I mean, it's kind of funny when they're just like, they just kind of do their own thing. If I ask you to do one thing though, like tell me one funny thing or one like quirky thing your animal did, it's easy to think of it. If I now were to go, tell me 25 funny things your cat did this week. Like you're never going to be able to think of it. And so because I'm asking for more and more, the availability heuristic kicks in. So if I ask you for just one, you then think of one immediately and think, oh yeah, that cat's real funny. I remember real quickly how funny my cat is. But if I ask you for 25, by the end, you're really struggling. And then you're starting to doubt yourself. And you're like, maybe that, maybe that cat isn't so funny after all. When really you've just laid out 24 things, like from a, like a bird's eye view, if you can name 24 funny things your cat did, your cat's pretty funny. If you can only name one, it doesn't necessarily mean your cat is funny. And yet if you only name one, you're way more confident that you've got a funny cat than if you've named 24. And this also, uh, they've done this, if you ask people like, name one time you were very assertive as a person, people will walk away from naming that one time very confident that they are a very assertive person. If you ask people to come up with 15 times, they walk away with a lot of self-doubt. And it's simply because they have trouble thinking. I mean, it's hard to think of 15 of anything. So you start to doubt. So this is another really weird thing. And this can be used, I mean, to um, like to, to, to go down a dark hole with this one. This, the, the availability heuristic gets exploited sometimes in like abusive relationships or abusive partnerships where somebody like you feel something is the case, but a partner tells you like, you need to give me more examples than that. Well, that is causing you to now doubt your own side of the story and go with theirs. So that would be another case in which availability here is. I was gonna say, it sounds similar to like gaslighting. Yes, Ga and I think gaslighting is very much tied in with the availability heuristic. So gaslighting is like just, I never know what the technical definition of gaslighting it's is. It's making you question, yeah, like question what you were thinking. Yeah. It's like, are you sure that this is what happened? Because actually what happened is, it's so. So yeah, it's a way of questioning someone with the purpose of getting them to question their own belief in themselves. And the availability heuristic is one of the ways in which gaslighting is able to get off the ground. If you force somebody to like, okay, that's just one example. Give me another example. Well, as they go give more and more, they start to question, even if on some level. <laughs> Sorry, David. Okay. Um, even if on some level you know it in your gut that it's true, you can begin to doubt yourself as people ask you for more and more cases. So yeah, that's another like nefarious way. So the reason to know about these heuristics is because they can be like, you are all guilty of them. I am most certainly guilty of them. Um, another one with the, uh, the randomness, whenever you have that feeling of, you know, um, the gambling addiction, sort of thing of like, I got four, I, I lost the past three times, I'm due for a new change of luck. Like I'm, I, I'm due for it. That's the same sort of randomness case where you feel like there must be a reason or pattern when really it's completely random and people can fall prey to that as well. Um, so those are our first two heuristic. What's the last one? Um, anchoring. The last one is called anchoring. Um, I tried to do this one in person uh, last class, but it didn't work so well. But the basic idea behind anchoring is this. All right, did George Washington die before or after the age of 144, 144 years old? Was he younger or older than 144 when he died? Younger, yeah. How old was he? Okay, so we're you know, 50, 56. Now, imagine if instead of asking, was he 150 or 144, if I asked you, how old was George Washington? Was he older than 10 when he died or was he younger? What would you all say? Older. older. And then I ask you, how old was he? Generally speaking, your answer is going to be affected by the last thing you were presented with. So generally speaking, if you ask people the question, like everyone knows George Washington's not 144, but the guesses that people give are generally going to be in like the 50s, the 60s. Everyone knows George Washington lived past 10. But if you ask people how old he was when he died after 10, people are going to guess things in the 40s and 50s. So generally speaking, what you were presented with first serves as an anchor from which you affect your guess. So if I give you 144, the average you guess might be, say, 59. If I give you 10, your guess might be like 51. So this is what anchoring is. Another example is if I asked you something of like, um, 
an actual practical case is you go to a museum or something, or you go to a concert and they say, suggested donation is $5. Um, on average, nobody's giving above $5. And probably people might go on average, give $3. If I say suggested donation is $25, nobody's giving $25, but odds are that they'll probably drop it. Maybe they'll give $10 a pop. So just by saying what the suggested donation is, you can affect how much people are willing to donate because everyone's decision is going to be affected on what you put on the, you should bet on this thing or how much you should give. It serves as an anchor from which you make other decisions. Um, so the reason that anchoring is useful is because it's useful to know because it can very much be used against you or it's something you have to be aware of where if you're like thinking what is the correct answer to a question or if somebody's trying to get you to donate the money, depending on what they've said to you, it can impact how likely you are to pay them more than you otherwise would have. So this is again, um, if you're um, Is negotiation like, like for sure officers, um, so one of the, there are a few different techniques for negotiating, but one of the negotiation um, approaches is typically what's called the door in the face. It's basically you approach someone with an amount that is so outrageously over the top that no one who knows anything would ever accept it. So if I'm like, I'll sell you this water bottle for $50,000 and you're going to be like, absolutely not. So I start with 50K for a water bottle that's worth like a dollar. And you're never going to agree to that. But by saying this, you are now more likely to agree to say $5 than you would have been if I had started with 10. Because you'll be like, well, we started at 50. And this then pulls it. You pull it all the way from 50,000 to five bucks. You're like, I'm getting a deal. But if I start at 10, then you're never going to agree to at five because you're like, that's only half of what you started with. And it's a crappy water bottle anyway. So that is a method of negotiation. So this is one that is very common. Um, used car salesman, anybody who's trying, the person at the Best Buy who's trying to sell you that HDMI cord you don't need. Um, that's another one where, you know, you know, you might not need this, but, you know, what we can bring it to, they'll try to sell you the best. Why do they always start with the top end TV, even if you've told them you can't buy it? Well, because maybe they can get you to buy the second highest price TV because you already feel like a they brought down. So that is anchoring. You present someone with one thing, and then based on that, it affects what their decision is based on what you presented them with first. And so you can see like practical ways in which this is um, affecting and something that comes up in your everyday lives. Again, it's another reason why if like, you know, if you first get, if you're told you get a 100 on your test, and then your professor reaches out to you, it's like, I made a mistake, you got a 98 you're going to be kind of disappointed. Well, if I tell you like you got a 70 and then I'm like, oh, I miscalculated. You got a 77. You're going to be pretty happy. Even though a 98 is way better than a 77 and yet you're going to feel better about your 77 than you would about your 98. Again, it's the same sort of thing. This anchoring, what you start with affects what your next uh, feelings are going to be. Um, and there's actually, I think the psychology of why, um, why anchoring works is kind of interesting because these are just useful things to know about how the human mind works because they have more general um, applications. So the main, well, there's two things. One of them is just, uh, I, I'm just gonna write it. There's not really a way of talking about this that's nice. Way of thinking um, is anchory. I, I'm not even gonna write this up here, but I'm just gonna explain it. Basically the idea is this. Every one of us, when we go around in our lives, we don't know for certain what the answer is to most things. Like, for instance, if I asked you what my age was, if I said I was five, you'd all be like, that's complete bullshit. And if I said I'm 120, you'd all be like, that's complete bullshit. However, if I said I was like 30, you might be like, eh. If I said I was like 39, you might be like, eh. If I said I was like 45, maybe. If I said 20, eh, maybe. Um, so there's a range at which you could at least think it's somewhat believable. And honestly, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter exactly what my number is 
Like, it's not like we're playing a guessing game. This isn't the DMV. So whether I'm like 30 or 39 really doesn't matter that much to you. So if I initially ask you, am I 50 or older? You're going to say no. And then I ask you, well, then how old am I? Your way of thinking is generally speaking, we have 50 in our mind already. So you're going to start moving downwards from 50 because we start at 50 and you know it's down. You're going to get to like 40 and you're going to be like, well, probably not quite that. You're going to get to say, I don't know, let's just say... 38, I don't know. And you're like, maybe I'm too lazy to think about this anymore. This is a stupid game. Let's just stop at 38. If I start off with 10, you're gonna be like, that's complete bullshit. Let's move up. And we're gonna get to, I don't know, whatever the first number that seems reasonable. And we'll say 29. And then you're gonna be like, oh, well, that seems reasonable enough. Well, I'm done thinking about this. Not worth the effort. I'll stop at 29. Just the way we think, unless it's like a super high important situation, most of us are going to stop at a number that seems like the first number that seems within the range of reasonableness, because it's not worth the mental effort to go any farther. So that's one of the reasons why this anchoring effect works. And so one of the reasons in which like a salesman will start at a high number and try to get you down is there's going to be a point at which the first number that seems reasonable, they try to sell you the car for 50,000. You think that's unreasonable. They get you down to 38. And that's the first number that seems reasonable to you. It's still five, $5,000 above market value, but it seemed reasonable. So you agree to it. The other reason that these sorts of anchoring effects happen is what is called priming. Has anyone heard of priming before? Any, anybody else? What is, what is priming? Anyone want to try to give a stab at it? Those of you who know, Ryan, anybody else? No, no pressure. I've honestly just heard it used before. I it, can't like explain it. Totally, to totally fine. Yeah, so the basic idea of priming is this. Um, the way the human mind works, and we all have trains of thought, like you first think of like a choo-choo train, so then you think of the time you rode a choo-choo train, and then you think about your grandpa. And so the way our mind works is it's these little chains where one thing causes another that causes another. And one thing about how the human mind works is the way you were thinking before, and you can see by a train of thought, what you were thinking before basically activates other parts of your, your the best way of thinking about it is, um, the human mind is a bunch of little cells that are connected with electricity and the thickness of the actual brain connections is determined by how often electricity runs across it. So if you've had a thought like, and this is part of the reason why obsessive thoughts happen is if you think something a lot, the actual neural connection gets stronger and then it's easier to think that thing again. And that's just the way the brain works. So the thing with priming is if you think one thing, it will very often make it easier to think something else that's related to that because the brain has literally been rewired to make those things more easy to think. So a classic example of this is with word combinations. So when I say peanut butter, what do you think immediately? Jelly. Jelly. Just about everyone does it. When I say new, what comes out next? Old or York or something like that. You're not going to think spaghetti. No one's thinking new spaghetti. Like that's, those aren't random. Those are completely random things. So priming is this way in which what we've thought before will affect what we think next. And what we have in a lot of these anchoring cases is it will prime you to imagine a certain sort of thought. So when I tell you the age 144, that primes you to think of an old person. So now you, you're, you're thinking of an old person. And this old person now is in your mind. So it's now going to be easier for you to think of George Washington as an old person than it would have been if I had started with age 10. And this might not be conscious. And here's the thing about the human mind. Most of the processing that we do happens below the level of our awareness. Um, most of our decisions happen below the level of our awareness. Many of our calculations happen below the level of awareness. It's a clear case is just like bodily movements. Like I don't have to calculate mathematically how wide to hold my hand to pick up my water bottle. It just happens. But a lot of things that you might, I mean, driving, if any of you are like, have been driving for years, like most of the time that you're driving, you're not thinking about it actively. It's happening below the level. You're just kind of doing it. And anytime you've learned to, I mean, those of you who are writing right now, it's not like you have to think like, how do I move this for letter A? It's now just happens unconsciously. So in the same way, when I say 10, you're now picturing like, a, I don't know, that's a kid holding a basketball. 
this is George Washington with his basketball. So now you have this image of a child. So now when you're thinking of George, he's young and healthy and it's gonna affect how you think. So that's the second thing. And why priming is so interesting is because it has a lot of actual practical implications in ways that you wouldn't expect and can be, it's part of, um, Part of the reason that people thought subliminal messaging worked for so long, and do people know what I mean by subliminal messaging? It's like you flash something really fast, almost like faster than someone can process it. And people were like, so the Coca-Cola company is flashing buy Coke in the middle of their ads and it's convincing you to buy Coke. Um, and I mean, Coca-Cola, not cocaine. Um, <laughs> those are different. Uh, although supposedly, I don't, did they ever, was it true that it originally had like cocaine? Yeah, yeah I thought it was. Um, so yeah. Go back in time and you can have cocaine with your coca-cola um but uh the idea with priming and and the reason why subliminal messaging seemed reasonable is there's been a lot of really interesting studies that suggest that it can have pretty significant impacts on our life so one that's really not all that interesting is um most of the priming studies have been done with words and basically what you do is you show someone a bunch of words or a bunch of strings of letters and you ask them as quickly as they can to press one button if yes it's a word and a different button if no it's not a word so like if i gave you um florida blurg And I literally just presented these to you one at a time. Florida, blurred. So let's do it. Is this a word? 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 That's the test. That's literally the whole test. But what they found is that it, it has a few different um, things. One thing is, what do all of these words have to do with? Florida retirement king. Old, old people. So if I were to now present you with something like, um, what's, what's something else with old people? Golf or um, dentures. dentures. If I were to present you with the word dentures, you would be quicker to recognize dentures than you would if I gave you the word spaghetti, completely unrelated to old people. And it's fractions of a second, but it's still like enough that your brain is somehow. But the most interesting one that they did, and this, this experiment, I'm not sure if everyone is, experiments after a while, everyone starts to question, are they actually good experiments or not? But one of the most famous experiments on this is they gave people this, and that was the study, was just answering these questions. But what they then did is they told the people, all right, we have a break now, go walk down the hall and get yourself a glass of water, freshen up, whatever you need to do. And they then timed how long it took a person to walk down the hall to get water from the water fountain. And they found that the people who have been primed with old people words walked more slowly. <laughs> so literally thinking about old people puts you in the frame of mind of walking like an old person. Simply by, and like, and this wasn't because I was like, pretend you're an old person. It's literally all they did was have to answer whether words like Florida retirement denture and cane were words or not. And then you gave somebody words related to like completely unrelated things, things to do on a Friday night. and it didn't affect how fast they walked. So these are the ways in which priming, and you can see, and this is something we'll be talking about more, um, I think next week, when we're discussing social psychology, the ways in which these sorts of things get used by advertisers to, you know, part of the reason why people in, in commercials are always so happy and excited and beautiful is that primes you to be happy and feel excited and want to be beautiful and go and buy their beer or buy their insurance or buy their thing that has nothing to do with actually being happy or beautiful or anything like that. So um, that's what we're, next class, we're gonna be covering a couple more heuristics. These ones I think are just as interesting. Um, again, midterms are due Thursday, but if you need an extension on it, just let me know. Uh, computer people, thank you for hanging in there. How Computer people, did this go okay? It went great. Personally. Okay, awesome. Then we're just going to keep doing this, this synchronized, asynchronous, same sort of thing. I'll keep taking attendance just so I can um, know everyone's here. Um, so yeah, this is perfect. Thank you, those of you who are here in person. Thank you all so much for coming. And thank you all for like, I'm just excited that I get to see actual people now. <laughs>
All right, everybody, again, if you have any questions or need an extension on the midterm, feel free to ask, and I'm going to end the recording right now. I just Can have I... a quick question, Professor. Oh, yeah.